Hey guys, in this episode we look at the Fuji X-E3 and the X-T20 and we answer the question, which of these two bodies am I going to keep and which am I going to sell? I'd be lying if I said I didn't already have an idea of which of these I think I might keep. But while I do this video, I figured I'd prolong the suspense, kind of bachelor style. It's gonna be the next big reality TV show. Now, before we get too far into it, you should know that I really love both of these cameras a lot. Even if they did nothing more than hold Fuji glass. <laughs> For me, that's a win because uh, really that's, that's the, the main draw uh, to this system is the, is the glass, those lenses. Uh, I've fallen in love with the size and the quality, um, the stunning image quality that they present. As Fuji lens holders, these two bodies are great. They borrow the technology that made that X-Pro2 and the X-T2 such great powerhouses of cameras in such a compact little package. And, uh, and, they, and they made it even smaller. They both have that delicious X-Trans sensor. They both use that same powerful autofocus system. There's just so much to love about both of these bodies. Um, and they're also very similar. I'm a big fan of both of them, and I really don't think you can go wrong either way. Now, as I go along with this review, I'm, I'm gonna also intermingle it with some shots from both cameras. I'm up in the beautiful Snow Canyon, Utah. The sky and the light today is not what we'd call anything special, so, uh, I'm opting for a kind of detail shots, maybe black and white um, or shadowed. So that's what we've got to work with. So there's a lot of similarities between these cameras. In many ways, they're probably, you could say, the same camera, um, just a different interface controlling them. There's not a whole lot of differences to discuss when it comes to what they do. So mainly it comes down to interface and body style. They're both priced the same. They have similar build quality. Um, you're looking at the magnesium alloy. It's kind of plasticky magnesium alloy, which, you know, is expected for the price point that we're talking about. Both cameras have the touch LCD. Both cameras suffer from the issue with the the uh, tripod mount being too close to the battery. So if you shoot landscape, you're going to need an L bracket, really. The max shutter speed is the same. The viewfinder coverage is the same. They have the same plus or minus five exposure comp with one third stop intervals. Both of them have the full auto mode. That comes in handy when you need to hand your camera to someone who doesn't know what they're doing for a quick snap of your family when you're traveling. Or if for some reason you need to just grab something that's happening on the side um, without the, the settings that you have it set for. You can quickly just hit that dial and grab your shot and then go back to what you were doing. The biggest difference probably that you'll see in the menus is that there's Bluetooth connectivity in the X-E3, whereas there is no Bluetooth in the X-T20. Additionally, the X-E3 gives you an all focus mode which allows you to uh, switch between focus modes with the rear dial and it has a store mode orientation option. Finally in the playback menu the X-E3 gives you the voice recorder which the X-T20 does not give you. They're both really light cameras, and a lot of people have asked me about the balance and suggested that maybe it's uh, a deterrent for them having a body that is uh, much lighter than a lens affixed to it. And you know what? This has always baffled me, this question of balance. I've never, I've never really understood it, because for me, I want as light as possible. The, the whole kit, as light as I can get it, the better. So even if the body is lighter vis-a-vis -vis the 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 camera lens, well to me that um, that's fine if it means that I have less weight that I have to haul with me all day long 
on shoots assignment or whatever I'm doing. And it also doesn't bother me when I shoot because I almost always hold um, this hand here at the base. If you were shooting one-handed all the time, um, then yeah, I could see it maybe being an issue, but you know, you can't really shoot these cameras one-handed with the aperture control being where it is. You've really got to have a hand there anyway. So that balances it. It's not an issue for me. Even when I've got the 50 to 140 attached to it, it's not an issue. Um, it never even really occurred to me that, until people started asking me about it. Well, I've got to take a break from review. I told you what these two camera bodies have in common. I haven't delved into the differences quite yet, but I'll have to do that after my next thing. I'm actually up here for two reasons for this video, but also because I have a client shoot, um, a portrait shoot with a family up here. So I got to go meet them. I'm going to use these two cameras with these two lenses on them for that, that shoot. I won't film it because, you know, I'll be on the clock, but I'll show you those photos and I'll talk to you about the strengths and weaknesses of these two great bodies on the flip. How you doing? Good. Hi, how you doing? Good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Let me throw a couple things in the car and then we'll, we'll start. Well, the shoot went well. I have to say, I enjoyed it a lot. I really, I always enjoy portrait photography, especially with families. You know, it's not for everybody, it's not everybody's thing, but it's, it's definitely my thing. I like connecting with people, I like kids, couples. It's fun to celebrate the joy of family and photography. And these cameras do a great job in those settings. Fuji makes excellent glass um, that's gonna work great in portrait settings, and really all you need is a decent camera to get you there, and these are great at, um, catching that eye with the autofocus, getting you great portraits. Anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about the differences between these two camera bodies, because there are definitely a few differences as similar as these two camera bodies are. I'm not gonna go any particular order, but the first thing I wanna say, the first difference is the D-pad on the X-T20 versus the joystick on the x E3. Because you can set the autofocus points with the D-pad on the X-T20, um, or you can set it, by default, it's set to be, uh, you know, various functions that the camera will give you. Um, X-E3 really had to give you those same functions in a different way because there is no D-pad. So the joystick, by default, on the X-E3 is going to be your focus point manipulation. Um, but to get those other functions, those same functions that, that, that are on the D-pad of the X-T20 or on the X-T2, um, you've got the swipe gestures. I'll come back to those. The other, you know, big difference, most obvious difference is style of body. They'll say the X-E3 is a rangefinder style. I, I really hate that because this is not a rangefinder. It's a mirrorless camera so you know rangefinder is a, a very specific meaning and this this is it's not a rangefinder but it, it's made to look like one and then you've got the traditional SLR type look of the X-T20 and as far as looks goes you know it's just matter preference I guess I think they both look great um, I won't base a decision based on the looks personally but you know maybe some people will I think what matters more are things like where the viewfinder is. Like, do you enjoy having that viewfinder on the left side of that body? Or do you prefer it right smack dab in the middle, like traditional SLRs do? Another key difference is in the, the sensitivity of the viewfinder. When I put my eye up to the X-E3, sometimes where I have glasses and we're in bright light, um, sometimes it fails to detect that my eye is up there to the screen, so I'll have to cup my eye up to that viewfinder for it to, to register that my eye is there. And that's been a source of actual frustration. More on that a little later. With the X-T20, you get a built-in flash. The X-E3, you do not, but they do include an external flash. When studying these two cameras, you'll also notice that the profile of those buttons is a little bit taller on the X-T20, giving you just a little bit more grippage. It's also a, a taller camera body, taller profile in general, so it comes with a little bit of a price, obviously. Switching drive modes 
It's not as pleasant an experience when it's a button on the back of the camera with the X-T3. The X-T20 gives you that drive mode as a dial, and uh, that's nice, and it comes in handy. But I will say this, when you're shooting hybrid and you're going back and forth between stills and video, I just don't have time in the Fuji system to rack that dial around to get from video to still. It's actually handy to have it as a drive button because they're on opposite sides of the menu. So you can go from still, then you can just hit up on the joystick to go down to the video mode. And that can actually be handy. So something to consider. The other thing that's really great, especially if you're a back button focus person, is the design of the X-E3. They've got this nice ridge and a very easy to access AFL button, which you can use to, to do some back butt button focusing. Because of that, this is the only Fuji body that I've played with that allows you a decent back button focus option. And I, I rather like it for that reason. So for those of you who are back button focus aficionados that might this might be the body that you'd be more interested in for that reason although i would say play with it because it might be in an awkward angle if you have really large hands in which case the xt20 gives you two options and you can stretch out a little bit more to them. just not as as tactile an experience on the xt20 probably the biggest though the most important difference between these two cameras the one you're probably going to base the decision on is that shutter sound that's the X-T20. I'll do it one more time. X-T20. X-E3. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, on both of these cameras, is the touch area focus feature. This was just released on the X-T20 with a firmware update and it uh, came shipped with the X-E3. And I was super, super excited about this feature. You've heard me talk about it before if you're a follower of the channel. The touch area focus, that's when you've got your eye up to the viewfinder and you can actually focus with your finger um, on the LCD screen. This was a, a feature that I loved on the Canon M5 and it's one that I was super hyped about for this. I did another video on that whole thing, um, talking about these two cameras, comparing it to the uh, uh, the Canon M5, because I, I felt like it warranted its own discussion, its own video. So please watch that video if you're interested in that feature. All I'm gonna say here is that that feature was a disappointment when it came to Fuji's implementation. So um, if that is one of the reasons why you want the X-E3, the X-E3 gives you more space to use that feature, I would, I would say you may, you may not uh, want to make that part of the deciding factor when it comes to deciding which of these cameras to use. Although uh, it is more pleasant to use on the X-E3 as long as you <laughs> disable the touch gesture feature because they, they don't work together. So I'm running out of daylight. I'm running out of things to talk about because these cameras are so similar. So let's just cut to the chase. Let's get to the heart of the matter. And let me tell you which of these two cameras has earned the right to stay in our camera bag as a backup to the X-T2 and which one of these is gonna go to a new home. Cue the dramatic music. XE3, you've been a good companion these last couple of months. We've loved having you on our shows, but I'm afraid that the win is gonna have to go to the XT20. As a consolation prize to the XE3, it does win for having a joystick, which is awesome and uh, having a, a decent back button focus option. But aside from those two factors, X-T20 wins for four reasons. Reason number one is that glasses problem. Now this isn't gonna be an issue to many of you, but for me it was. X-E3, trying to use it with glasses, it was too frustrating. It wasn't there for me when I needed it. X-T20, it's there. It always detects when my eye is close to that viewfinder. Reason number two <laughs> this is gonna be super shallow sounding, but it's the shutter sound. Oh, it's so good. That X-T20, it has a certain pop to it, almost like pressure has built up and released, kind of a 
a puff almost, so that when the shutter releases, it's so satisfying. XC3 it just sounds a little hollow to me. Reason number three, flip screen. When I shot with the XC3 for a while, when I first got it, I thought, well, maybe I'm not gonna need the flip screen, or maybe I won't miss it. No, that's not the case. If you've used the flip screen at all on other models like the X-T2, um, going back to non-flip screen, it was difficult for me. Um, I missed it a lot of times. And uh, maybe that's just the style of shooting I do. Maybe it won't for you, but for me, it was, it was hard to lose that feature, so. Reason number four, my final reason, the most important reason, is that this particular copy of the X-T20 is signed by Tony and Chelsea Northrup. Yes, indeed, folks. How could you part with a camera which has been marked by such hallowed hands as these? That's it, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this review. In all seriousness, guys, these are two great bodies. You can't go wrong. The differences are, are, are very, very subtle, and uh, you'll probably really enjoy shooting with either of them, um, is my bet. So until next time, happy shooting.